Blog Talk Radio. Mi chiamo Apura Kanu, Apura Kaitnu, ne ye ojira da, me tinde ojira po, kwesi ramen pata akan. Akwamu mai na manuka etipi mu ojira po, ojira mai mu. Greetings to all Apura Kani, Apura Kaitnu people, meaning African black people. Today is ojira day, purification day. My name is Ojirapo Kwesi Rodney Mata Akan. Ojirapo of the Akwamu Nation in North America. Within Ojirama, the purified nation, Afurakani, Afuraikani people in the Western Hemisphere. Yet I say we thank you once again for tuning in to the broadcast. We are opening up the chat room right now. If you have a question or a comment on the phone line, Simply hit the number one so that we can see that your hand is raised. If you have a question or a comment and would like to interact in the chat room, you must log in as a user in order to interact in the chat room. If you don't have a username, you can sign up for one quickly in BlogTalk so that you can interact in the chat room. For individuals who are new to the broadcast, we have three broadcasts on a weekly basis. We have Akanto Nanason, Ancient Authentic Akan Ancestral Religion on Joda on Monday night. We deal specifically with the Akan expression of ancestral religion. Number one, because we are Akan. Number two, because of the misinformation that has been propagated regarding Akan cosmology, religion, culture, philosophy, and so forth. We deal with it from an authentic perspective dealing with our ancient ancestral Akan ancestry going back to ancient Kanat, a title of ancient Nubia, all the way to West Afuraka Afrikai, we after migrating from East Afuraka Afrikai to West a couple of thousand years ago to reestablish the Kanat Empire, the Nubian Empire, the Empire of Kanat called Ghana. About a thousand years later, some of our people migrated from that region further south to the regions of today's Republic of Ghana and Ivory Coast and reestablished Akana civilization in the Savannah and Forest Belt region. Hundreds of years after that, some of our people were snatched up and taken during the Musuo Ketye, the Great Perversity, the Enslavement Era, and forced into North Central South America, the Caribbean, and Europe forced migration into enslavement, and we carried our Akana or Akan ancestors with us in our blood circles, fossilized within the bones and blood of our people. And we were empowered by our Akan ancestral religious practices to wage war against the whites and their offspring, massacre the whites and their offspring, kill the whites and their offspring, and free ourselves from enslavement and force an end to enslavement in the Western Hemisphere, including North America. So we deal with the Akan tradition on Monday night, ancient authentic Akan ancestry religion under Akanfo Nanason. On Awukuda, Akwada, Wednesday nights, we have Egua, which is marketplace, and we have businesses, organizations, and institutions in our community who are serving the Afurakani, Afurakani community in a positive capacity, but those who also maintain their ancestral religious values in the process. We have published the Okom Economic Development Model. It is an economic development model rooted in our ancestral religious values. It is therefore a holistic approach to economic development for our people. Part of that process, the strategy used and employed is to starve the beast and feed the prize. That means on a weekly basis, we make a determination with regard to what funds we would have potentially wasted with the whites and their offspring, and then we starve the beast and feed the prize. We reallocate those funds away from those white businesses and direct them to the business organization or institution of the week. We are targeting one Afurakani Afurakani business organization or institution per week for 52 weeks for optimal capital infusion. 
when we starve the beast and feed the pride and take the 10 or $15, as you say, away from those white businesses and reallocate them to the business of the week, then that 10 or $15 when a thousand of our people engage that process, that is an infusion of ten or fifteen thousand dollars into a black business in the course of seven days, and therefore they are able to expand their products and services to us. They are able to hire black people, of course, within the community to work in the business to serve us at a greater capacity. It keeps our dollars, our money within our community. If we do not engage that process, then by default. We are leaving the funds, the money, in the hands of our absolute enemies, the whites and their offspring. And therefore, by default, we are financing our own oppression. So we have Egwa Marketplace on Wednesday night. When you look on our Ocom Economic Development Model page, you'll see the list of businesses, organizations, and institutions that we have been supporting. You'll also see a list you also see the links to their website, but you also see the link to the uh, interviews that they did with us on the Egua Marketplace show. Where they sat with us for a couple of hours and went through the information dealing with their business, their service to the community, and how their ancestral religious values inform their service to the community. So that's on Egua Marketplace Day on our Wukuda Akuada Wednesday night. Tuesday night which is Benada, Abenada, we have Ojira. Ojira means purification. In the Akan language, it also means a celebration of purification. Our seven-day New Year celebration is called Ojira, as well as Obrajira in North America. On the continent, many Akan folks celebrate Ojira, purification for seven days of the New Year celebration. The same term can be found and has its root in our ancestral language and culture of ancient Kanat and Kemet. The term Jida, as written in the Medutu, the hieroglyph, means purification. It also means a celebration of a ceremony of purification. Same term with the same meaning because we never stop practicing Ojida. So when we talk about Ojida purification, we always say Ojira operationalizes Nanasong. Ojira purification operationalizes Afurakani, Afurakani, or African ancestral religion, which we term Nanasong. Ancestral religion, in essence, is the ritual incorporation of divine law and the ritual restoration of divine balance. That means through ritual, we incorporate those things, objects, deeds, and entities we need to incorporate in order to harmonize our thoughts, intentions, and actions with divine order. And through ritual, we reject those things, objects, deeds, and entities we need to reject in order to restore balance to our thoughts, intentions, and actions, and therefore realign ourselves with divine order. So the ritual incorporation of divine law and the ritual restoration of divine balance are the expansive and contractive poles of ancestral religion. Ojira, purification, operationalizes Nanasong. Purification operationalizes our practice of ritually incorporating law and ritually restoring balance to our lives. Our culture is rooted in the divine acceptance of order and the divine rejection of disorder. We seek to align every thought, every intention, and every action with divine order every moment of every day. So our Ojira broadcast deals with purification, deals with the operationalizing of ancestral religion through purification, that we can align our thoughts, intentions, and actions every moment of every day, and therefore ancestral religion is shown to impact every aspect of our lives because every moment of every day we're engaged in a process of aligning every thought, intention, and action with divine order. So it's not just something that we deal with on a one or two days a week. It is every moment of every day. So we deal with a number of different things on our Ojira broadcast in that context. What we want to deal with tonight and the title of the show tonight, Kudu Ne Akundi, Root Work, the Precedent for Chemical 
and biological warfare. Many people believe that chemical and biological warfare began with the wife and their offspring. That is totally inaccurate. That's inaccurate with regard to our people around the world for thousands of years. It is inaccurate with regard to our people in the Western Hemisphere, including in North America. When our people were forced into North America during the Musuo Kekie, the Great Perversity, the Enslavement Era, we brought our knowledge not only of physical warfare, fashioning metal armaments from various metals and so forth, but also we brought our knowledge of medicine our knowledge of medicine for healing, our knowledge of medicine for warfare. So the term akun means to battle, war, akundi is warfare. Medicine or nduru or ndu, as it's called in the Akan tradition as well as in ancient Kanat and Kemet. And of course, ndu, medicine, is the origin of the term hudu in the Akan people in North America and hudu, of course, is the Akan and such religion in North America, Hindu or medicine is used for healing. Medicine is used for killing. Healing and killing. Divine functions of medicine. This has always been the case for thousands of years, and it is the case today. We utilize medicine to heal our people and bring our people bodies, and the collective of the community in harmony with divine order after disease has brought forth disorder. We utilize medicine to wage war against our enemies, to exterminate our enemies. And that is sacred, is divine. It is not only in harmony with divine order and within our capacity, but it is our divine obligation. It is our response responsibility to eradicate and exterminate the murderous enemies of our people. And we utilize every tool, every method, metal armament, as well as chemical and biological warfare rooted in our ancestral religion. This has always been the case. So we want to show that information tonight. Going back to the plantation in the so-called 1600s, so-called 1700s, and so forth, and on. We give an example dealing with in Virginia. There were restrictions placed on those who were enslaved, who were actually healers, and healers said. They saw that our people came with knowledge. Our people also came with actual seed within the amulets that they wore, within their hair, within their clothing, and so forth, brought from the continent seeds for healing, herbs, and so forth. We brought this knowledge, and then once we came here and interfaced with nature here, we were able to learn the secrets and properties of plant life and mineral life once we came here. It was not a process where we had to sit at the feet of some pseudo Native American, Asian migrants, invaders who are invaders to this hemisphere, Afurakani, Afurakani people, African black people are the first people to migrate to this hemisphere thousands of years before these white Asian invaders existed on earth. And once they came into existence and came from Siberia and other parts of Asia, to invade North, Central, and South America and the Caribbean, our people were already here. And they began to wage war against our people. They have been the enemies of our people all along, and they still are the enemies of our people. These are pseudo-Native Americans. Our people were here first, and we migrated here from Afuraka, Afuraka. So we did not come to sit at the feet of a pseudo-Native American to learn earth. This is the misinformation that is taught by the whites in our spring and mimicked by blacks. We went directly into the forest 
We went into the swamps. We went into the grasslands and wherever we needed to go to interface with nature, learning from plant life, mineral life, as well as animal life, communicating with the sun sun, the spirit of plant life, communicating with the sun sun, the spirit of animal life, communicating with the sun sun, the spirit of mineral life. And they would direct us as to how to procure medicine from them, utilize that medicine to heal our people, utilize that undo that medicine to kill our enemy. So we learned that directly. Of course, that has always been part of our process. We have healers and healeresses from very early ages who can go out in nature and communicate directly with plant life and learn directly from them. The spirit that animates plant life will communicate directly with the child as well as into adulthood. When someone has an illness, this particular plant, this particular mineral, communicate directly to the spirit of the individual, directing them to procure that plant at that particular time of the year, of the day, of the night, and so forth, in the manner they need to procure it to bring balance to the disease state within the person. We've always had that practice for thousands of years. And that included when we were forced to migrate here. One of the major examples of that reality that anybody can check out, of course, is Nana Kwame Afrani, Afrani, who was called George Washington Carver. Of course, he transformed agriculture, not only in America, but around the world, drawing hundreds of products innovating hundreds of products from sweet potatoes and peanuts and so forth. But when they asked him how did he gain his knowledge to be able to produce and extract all the wealth and treasure from these natural plants and so forth, he said he would go out every morning, early in the morning, communicate with the spirits in nature, in plant life. They would communicate their properties to him. And then he would take what he learned directly from these spirits and replicate that within the laboratory, this transformed agriculture in America and around the world. This is an Afurakani man, a Hudu man, an Odumafo, a medicine man, someone who has the capacity to do what our people have been doing for thousands of years. It wasn't because he went and sat at the feet of some pseudo-Native American, and he didn't go sit at the feet of anybody else. He learned directly from the abosom, the deities in nature. He learned directly from the spirits that animate plant life and mineral life. Just as he has that capacity, so do many people in our community today have that capacity. There's one or more people within every ancestral clan who has that capacity within every ancestral family, every blood circle in your families, whether it's you yourself or someone in the family has that capacity. The White Snarl Spring understand this, so this is one of the reasons, of course, why they try to keep us away from ancestral religion, because of the fear that they have with regard to our capacity to wage chemical and biological warfare to exterminate them on a mass scale simply from the forest, from the swamp, from the birth and born of our religion. Giving an example of, of that fear that the whites and their offspring have held going back to Virginia. In Virginia, the decades between 12,791 and 12,809, or so-called 1791-1809, were marked by a series of rebellions, wars, black people waging war against the whites and their offspring. The Virginia state records show that between, quote-unquote, 1780 and 1864, this is in Virginia, 58 enslaved Afurakanu, Afuraikaitnu, were convicted of poisoning or attempted poisoning, no matter how much the white so-called slave owners relied on and trusted on the so-called 
slave healers, Afurakani, Afurakani healers, they also feared them. They feared them because they were constantly finding and having, at some point, capturing some of them and convicting them of poisoning the so-called slave masters or attempting to poison the so-called slave masters. That fear prompted them to enact law going back to 1748. Now, number one, they forced our people on ships of enslavement. Our people come over here. They know that they are healers, and healer is dead. So when some of our people get sick, the whites in our offspring have no capacity to heal our people. But they want our people to be healed because they want them to still be strong so they can continue to slave away on plantations and in other areas. So the only people who can heal their fellow enslaved Afurakani, Afurakani people were the, the healers and healeresses within the population. So they relied on our people to heal one another. And of course, our people were going to seek to heal their brothers and sisters. But at the same time, they feared them because they knew that we were engaged in poisoning the whites and their offspring. And we would utilize that medicine to poison them. They had that experience on a consistent basis. They convicted as many people as possible. Many of them, they never convicted. So they began to pass law. It was so prominent that they began to pass law, enacting law. As early as 1748, for example, the colony of Virginia forbade, quote, unquote, any Negro or other slave to administer, quote, unquote, any medicine whatsoever under the pain of death without benefit of clergy, meaning that if someone became sick, one of our own people became sick, they were so fearful of our people going to gather medicine that they act, acted laws that you cannot heal your, your peer. You can't heal them. You have to wait until a white clergy person shows up to watch what you're doing in order to heal them because they were so fearful that as soon as we touch the medicine, we would not only use it to heal, but we would seek a way to poison the slave, so-called slave master, his wife, children, and so forth, which we had continued to do. So they would have somebody monitoring at that time. This is going back to 1748. And this is just Virginia. But this is, of course, all over the South, as well as into the North. Of course, there was slavery in uh, New York. There was enslavement in Illinois. There were it wasn't just the South. So this is what was taking place. So what is the provenance of this healing capacity? Because we have this healing capacity, and we've utilized it to great effect. We've established a precedent to utilize not only physical armaments to wage war against the white snarl spring, but also chemical and biological warfare. When we look at the rebellion of Kwabena, so-called Denmark VC, organizing over 9,000 people in South Carolina to wage war against the whites and their offspring, to take over the entire city. They were using their own blacksmiths to manufacture their own weapons. One of the plans, just in case, the scorched earth policy, just in case the rebellion, the resistance, the war didn't get off to the start that they wanted it to get off to. One of the plans that was a replacement plan of scorched earth policy was that they would poison the water supply in the city and kill everybody in the city. Chemical and biological warfare. When they had the trial and some of the information and testimony was given during the trial, in the trials of the, the followers of Kupo Kwabena, Denmark, BC, some of them giving testimony. Much of that testimony was not captured in the local newspapers. They refused to put the testimony out in the local newspapers at the time. They recorded it, but they did not want the larger population to see what was in the testimony. 
The reason they didn't want the larger population to see what was in the testimony is because of the great organization of thousands of people, thousands, over 9,000 people organized, black people working next to the white canal stream every day when the white canal stream didn't realize that these black people were part of an organized rebellion, a war, and they had planned to exterminate every white individual, male, female, and baby in the city. They feared that if that information got out, the white offspring in the city would flee the city. It would corrupt and collapse the economy, and people would be on a terror alert perpetually. They didn't want people to know that we were so organized that we had planned to poison the water supply and kill everybody in the city. So they left that information out of the public record of the testimony. So these kinds of things have been happening ever since we've been here. Physical armament, chemical and biological weapons of warfare. The women carrying seeds from the forest in their hair. When they get back inside the house, cooking the food and making the soup and so forth, they create what they need to create with the seeds, with the plant life, with the mineral life, poison the whites in their offspring, they become sick, and therefore we can rout them and exterminate them, or they simply die from the poison. We burn down the plantation, free our people from enslavement, and go to our independent, quote-unquote, maroon settlements, our quote warrior, warrioress settlements, and establish independence in those areas. We have that capacity that is the precedent that has been set by our direct blood ancestresses and ancestors. Going into the forest, learning what specific plants and minerals need to be procured at what time, how to be utilized, how to be combined so that can be created that will destroy the DNA of the whites and their offspring and have no ill effect upon our people. We not only have that capacity, but it's our resources responsibility to defend our people by any means necessary. So where does this information come from? Where does this precedent begin? This precedent that was expressed in North America was simply the perpetuation of our culture. So we can go all the way back to ancient Kanat and commit, for example. When you look at what the writer Herodotus said about the uh, war against the Assyrians and relating the specific story about the war against the Assyrians, when our people in ancient Kemet were invaded by the Assyrians, they talk about the Assyrian army at nighttime being devastated. How were they devastated? The people went to the priests, our people went to the priests of Ptah and priestesses of Ptah. And Ptah, the divinity Ptah, sent an army of rodents to go at nighttime and chew away the bowstrings and the shields of the Assyrian army. So when day arose, their shields were destroyed. The rodents had destroyed the shields, and then we routed the Assyrian army and massacred the Assyrian army. And so this story is related by Herodotus about the priests of Ptah and so forth and how the army was destroyed. What it is actually pointing to is the plague. Rodents, the black rat, is the carrier of the pest that caused the plague that same plague that devastated the Romans during the time called the Plague of Justinian, about uh, 600, quote-unquote, 542, quote-unquote, A.D. and so forth, which destroyed the Romans, wiped out a large percentage of Southern Europe, and Southern Europe goes into a dark ages for hundreds of years. Right after Justinian, sets forth an edict to close the last temple of Osset in Paraka in Philae. Then they get hit with the plague 
and it wipes the whites and their offspring out, and they go into a dark ages for hundreds of years, only beginning to recover about five, six hundred years later, as they begin to stir in Europe for the next hundred plus years and start gaining some ground once again, then Europe is hit with the Black Death or the so-called bubonic plague. Within five years, one-third to one-half of the entire population of Europe is wiped out by the plague. At the same time, you find in the Western Hemisphere, North, Central, and South America, there's a plague that hits North, Central, and South America, wiping out millions of the pseudo-Native Americans, the Asians who had invaded, but then some of our people were already over here, of course, as well, and we get hit with that plague that the whites and offspring brought that plague with them when they came over here, the Europeans coming over here, and they, they have that, that disease, they have that pest within them, that bacterium, and they carry that into the Western Hemisphere, and then people began to get hit with the plague, and they're being wiped out by the millions in North America, Central America, South America, the Caribbean. The white and Nile Spring coming from Europe in the so-called 1400s, 1500s, they did not come and conquer the people. They brought disease, and those diseases wiped out the people ahead of time. And they would come to different villages and entire villages full of dead bodies and so forth. So this is what was taking place. But the key is when we talk about the divinity papa and talking about the waging of war against the immune system. It wasn't the physical shield of the Assyrian army that were destroyed by the rodents. The rodents were the carriers of the plague. Because they were the carriers of the plague, they destroyed the shield or the defense, the immune system of the Assyrians. And they came down with the plague. And then they were wiped out. They were routed by our army. But Ta is known as the bringer of plague and disease as a weapon of warfare, epidemic and pandemic. But Ta is connected and a husband of Sekhima or Sekhmet. People know about Sekhmet or Sekhima as the warrioress divinity, the divine sacred divinity dealing with divine hate on the female side, divine destructress of disorder, the enforceress of divine order. She also governs menstruation, spilling blood through menstruation, but also spilling blood through warfare to eradicate the enemy. She's the divine lymphatic system within the great divine body of the supreme being. She operates the lymphatic system of the Apurakani, Apuraikaitni, human being, but she is also known as the bringer of plague and disease, utilizing plague and disease and epidemics, pandemics as a weapon of warfare. So Papa and Sechima Sekhmet as husband and wife waging war through pandemics, epidemics, and so forth. You will find the same divinities all across Apuraka, Apuraikai, with the same function. So, for example, you will find Sakpata in Vodun, called the Sakpata twin. The Sakpata twin, male and female, Dazoji and Yokwe Ananu, these are the Sakpata twin, Sakmata twin, the Sakmeta twin, the Sekmet, Sekim and Sekmet twins, this is Papa and Sekmet. The Sakpata twins, who are the rulers of Earth. Of course, the Papa is at the center or the core, inner core of Earth, fashioning at the center of the core of Earth, master of the Earth in that regard. The first divinity, the first chief of Earth. When you go back and look at the quote unquote kings, lists, and so forth, Papa and his Pauk, the so called Ennead, the Papa and the divinities in connection with Pata are the first rulers of earth. Pata is at the inner core, fashioning at the inner core. 
and Sechima, that divine fire that you will find inside the inner core on the female side. They are the rulers of earth. They're bringers of plague and disease as weapons of warfare. And this is why the Sakbata twin, Dazoji and Yofe Ananu in Vodun are the rulers of earth, but they're also the bringers of plague and disease. And specifically in West Akuraka, Akurakai, they often focus on smallpox as a weapon of warfare. When they talk about Sakpata, the Sakpata twins bringing smallpox as an epidemic or a pandemic to wage war against those who are engaged in disorder, this is what they're dealing with. If you look at that same divinity, Sakpata, in the Yoruba tradition, he is called Obaluaye. If you break down the name Obaluaye, Oba means chief, king, Ulu means owner, Aye means earth. Obaluaye, or sometimes called Babaluaye, is the chief, owner, ruler of earth. Of course, this is Pata. He is the one who brings plagues and epidemics to wage war against those who are engaged in criminality, but he is also a divine healer. Same divinity by the same function. The same function in creation, even the titles are the same. The first chief or ba of Aye of earth. Pata is the first divinity who is the ruler of earth, and the same is true of Sakpata in Vodun, also called Omolu. And then you find in the Akan tradition, Pata is called Puata or Buada or Buade, pronounced Obuadie, and he's the fashioner, the excavator of earth, but he's also a divine healer. He's connected with Sechima, and she's, her name is pronounced in Akan. Sechima is Sekhmet. Sechima, of course, is that same divinity. Of course, the term Sechima and Akan also is the general term for menstruation. And all girls who, upon the onset of Minar, going through rites of passage, are called Sechima. Every girl in Akan culture called Sechima or Sekhmet when they go through their first menstrual cycle and so forth. And you have Obwadie and Sechima. And if we look at the breakdown of the name Obwadie, that divinity, then we will have a better understanding of who he is, who this divinity is, Obwadie, which is Wada or Porta Pata from ancient Kemet. So let's look at in the Akan language what the name means and its ramification. Adie means thing, object, deed, or entity. And then Ba, central piece we want to focus on. Ba often is talking about to create or to make. Or Ba, to create or make. Adie, thing, object D for entity. And the great idea or thing, the great thing or the great entity is the universe. So this is why they talk about Obwadie is the fashioner or maker or creator, fashioning in this sense, not the creator out of nothing. But once Ra and Rayat called Inyonkumpon and Inyonkumpon in the Akan tradition create the universe out of nothing, then Obwadie fashions or excavates or form that which has been created. So ba meaning to fashion or form or to make, and then adie, the thing, the entity. The great adie is the universe. So he's a obo adie, the fashioner of the thing, the entity, the fashioner of the universe. Exactly as he is as pata or poite, pata in ancient Kemet, the great divine fashioner of the universe. But there are more definitions of the term abo that we can go into. So if you look at the uh, Asanti Fanti dictionary, we can look at some different definitions of that root. Ba, of course, it means to make, to form, to fashion. But it also means to strike. That's the first thing. It can mean to grow or turn into, enter into close contact with. But then we have some other definitions that are more direct with regard to what we're talking about tonight. 
boss to inflict, to prick, to puncture, to drive into the ground, to counteract a movement. So we're talking about to strike, to inflict damage, to drive into the ground, to counteract. We're talking about not the healing aspect of medicine, but the killing aspect of medicine. Other sounds by the voice talking about incantation, to make, to procure, to cause, to practice. When you're talking about making or procuring or causing or practice, you're talking about making medicine, fashioning medicine, procuring medicine practicing medicine. These are all definitions of boss. And of course, the utter incantations, the ritual incantations to activate the sun sun, the spirit of the medicine. So the, the, the tumi, the power of the medicine can be utilized to great effect. It means to procure. It also means to apply, to call, to call forth, and a number of different meanings. So all these different meanings you will find at the root of the term, ba, ba idea, not only to make or fashion, ba idea is the thing, the entity, meaning the fashioner of the universe, but also to procure, to apply, to inflict, to puncture, to drive into the ground. We're talking about the defensive use of medicine. Offensive use of medicine is to heal illnesses. Defensive use of medicine, you're talking about killing the enemy, waging chemical and biological warfare. And that is not only within our capacity, it is our responsibility. So when we look in the Akan tradition, the Hoodoo tradition in North America, we look at our book, Hoodoo People, Akuraikainu in North America, Akan custodian of Hoodoo from ancient Hoodoo Nduunu land, Kanit Nubia. We'll put a link to that publication in the chat room. This is one of our 19 books. You can download the e-book version, all of our 19 books for free. And then, of course, we have the soft cover versions as well. So we'll put the link to the Home my page, the publications page in the chat room from our website. Where you can download this e-book version right now. And so, for example, when we go to page... 27, and we're talking about the term undu, and undu means medicine, coming from undua or undria, meaning trees, plants, stalks, roots, and so forth. Undu also means to become heavy with the spirit, the spirit to come down and become heavy when someone is engaged in ritual practice, ritual medicines, and so forth. They invoke and evoke the spirit to be our both so and insomnia, and they come down and become heavy with the spirit. And that spiritual power, that heaviness, that weight, determines the power or weightiness, the substance of the medicine, the potency of the medicine. When some has a when someone has a heavy spirit, tsum yeduru, the tsum is heavy, that means it's heavy, that means it's strong, that means it's powerful, that means it's potent. And the same thing happens when the spirits come down as we invoke and evoke them during the ritual process with regard to medicine. Then they become heavy with the spirit, and that energy is used to make that medicine potent and powerful. So we talk about that in the book, of course, showing Undu being the origin of the term Hudu, and going back to ancient Kanat, Nubian Kemet, Undu meaning root work in medicine and and sacrificial offerings on shrines and so forth, and we show that in the Medusu, even the, one of the names of ancient Nubia, Kanit, is called the Udu land and the people, the Udu people. So we've been utilizing that terminology to identify ourselves as ancient Kanit, or Akani, Akan people, in ancient Kanat, Nubia, in West Afraka, Afraka, and even into North America, we still identify our religion who do by the exact same name and call ourselves by the exact same type. So we say on page 27, the related term, bad, tall, medicine, do, or poison, 
one who uses bad medicine is thus called odutofo. We also have odudo, which is a medicine consisting of the juice of a plant or bark and water kept for weeks to dress wounds with. Moreover, we have aduboni, which is a contraction of edu, eduru, or indu, meaning medicine, and boni, meaning evil. Aduboni is another term for poison or quote-unquote bad or evil medicine. And then we show edria or edua, tree, plant, stalk, stem, dua, dria, to plant, eduru or indu, medicine, nduru or ndu, medicine, odun sinfo, a medicine person, oduyefo, root working medicine, working person, odudo, medicine, oduro, gravity, meaning the heaviness, but also the heaviness of a spirit, the presentiment of a spirit coming down, aduto, quote unquote, bad medicine, adubani, bad medicine or poison. It is bad medicine or poison being bad medicine. If you're using it against someone, you should not be using it again. If it's used in a criminal fashion, it is sacred and divine when you use that medicine against your enemies. The whites and their offspring are murderous enemies. So when we engage in offensive and defensive medicine that is in harmony with divine order. So we talk about the notion of nduru, nduru person or ndu person, hudu person, being the medicine person who works with griya, six roots to make ndu medicine, the origin of the oduyefo, and so forth. This is what we're talking about with regard to waging war against our enemies. This is what we're talking about when we're dealing with etchisa, ancestral religious reversion in the Akan language as well as the language of ancient Kemet. Chi means back. Sign means return. Echi sign means to return back. So when we talk about Echi sign, and we just had our Echi sign conference, Apurakani, Apuraikani, or African ancestral religious reversion. We don't convert somebody into something that means you're trying to convert them or transform them into a fake religion or pseudo-practice like Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Hinduism, and all that nonsense with their fictional cartoon characters who never existed of any race or in any form, which includes Jesus, Yeshua, Esau, Abraham, Isaac, Ishmael, Solomon, Sheba, Menelik, Moses, Aaron, Muhammad, Yahweh, Allah, Buddha, Brahman, all of these fictional cartoon characters. You have to force somebody to embrace that nonsense. You have to convert someone into that nonsense, to transform them into embracing that nonsense. We're talking about reversion, to revert back to our original pristine state, our original condition, reverting back or returning back sign to the pact we made with Inyamewa and Inyame, the great mother and the great father supreme being. Amenet and Amen. Attuning to the function we are to execute in creation. We talk about reversion, ancestral religious reversion. We also talk about self-reversionalization. When you reversionalize yourself, engage the process of communicating directly with your own kra, krawa, your ka, your kaya, the deity that dwells in your head region. When you engage in self-reversionalization and engage directly your own direct blood ancestresses and ancestors. When you engage in self-reversionalization and you engage directly the Abosom, the Orisha, the Vodou, the divinities, the Nsoru, Nsorotu, who are assigned to you pre-incarnation, whose energy you carry into the world, whose Inclinations are manifest through your natural inclinations towards certain thoughts, intentions, and actions, and disinclinations from certain thoughts, intentions, and actions. When you engage the process of self-reversionalization, and you return to your ancestral culture born of your blood circle, and you are one of the healers or healeresses who are designed to go out into the forest, into the woods 
into the savanna, into the swamps and so forth, to procure bar medicine, to make medicine, not only to heal our people, but to kill our enemy. That is a sacred and divine obligation. It is representative of the function that is written into your nature, always been part of the culture. This is the kind of revolutionary and resolutionary action that the whites and their offspring fear. This is one of the major reasons why they seek to keep us away from our ancestral religion, because through our ancestrally inherited religion, transcarnationally inherited, meaning we're bringing this religion with us spiritually into each incarnation. It is wired within our spirit before we even enter into the womb. So we are born into the world with our ancestral religion intact. With the ancestresses and ancestors of our blood circle assigned to us and guiding us. With the abosom, the force in nature, assigned to us and guiding us. We come into the world with these specific inclinations. The whites in our spring understand that. So they want to keep us away from that because they understand that once we align with the Abosom and Umsumapo, the deities and ancestral spirits who are assigned to us, then we will move on that assignment. We will operate according to those directives. We will operate according to what Unyamewa and Unyame, the great mother and great father, direct us to do. We move according to their direction, not the direction of the whites and their offspring. So any individual, or thousands of individuals at any time can become self-reversionalized, reverting back to their ancestral religious practices simply by connecting with the Abosom and Insumapo that are carried within their blood circle. And when they are directed to move and to procure and to manufacture medicine on an offensive and defensive capacity, and wage war chemically and biologically. No individual in the white community, none of the whites and their offspring can stop that process. They have no capacity to determine when the Abosom will tell one of the Akurakani Akurakani people on a specific day, today is your day to go out and wage war. They're not following some charismatic leader or some group. They are self-reversionalized, and that can take place at any time, in any place, internally. It cannot be tracked. It cannot be controlled. The whites and their offspring can't control when the Abosom communicate with you. The whites and their offspring cannot control when the Nananom Insamampo communicate with you. They can't determine who was born into the world to wage chemical and biological warfare under the direction of Inyamewa and Inyame. They understand that we have that capacity and that responsibility. So they're always on the lookout for those who embrace that capacity and responsibility and actualize it and affect it. This is why, of course, as we said, they seek to suppress any practice of ancestral religion. They seek to put myths around ancestral religion, try to make it appear that we had no ancestral religion in North America, make it appear that only people in the Caribbean and South America and on the continent maintain their ancestral religious practices. But black people in North America, we maintain nothing. But they will call it African-American folk magic, meaning just some little, little remedies of healing stuffy noses and different things and some little superstitious things that we held on to or listen to some European pseudo folk magic or some little healing remedies we quote unquote learn from pseudo Native Americans and call it a little superstitious African American folk magic and that's all we had. They don't want to give the real information but we are giving the real information. We have full ancestral religious traditions and practices as we showcase at our Echi Sign Ancestral Religious Reversion Conference last week. 
we have the Akan ancestry religion fully intact as Kudu in North America. We have the Yoruba ancestral religion fully intact as Juju in North America. We have the Bambara and Mendi ancestry religion fully intact as Grigri in North America. We have Vodun, the Fon and Ebe ancestry religion fully intact in North America. We have the Ovambo tradition, the Wanga tradition, fully intact as ancestry religion in North America. We have the Ingangan tradition, the Fang tradition of Gabon and Cameroon and so forth, fully intact in ancestry religion in North America. We still communicate with the ancestresses and ancestors. We still communicate with the deities who govern our blood service. And just as we did in the past, you have instances today which are not widely reported on when black people have used chemical and biological warfare to exterminate one or more of their enemies. These things are simply reported in news accounts as somebody getting sick and dying or some people in the community becoming ill or maybe they were, had food poisoning or maybe the water supply was poisoned and so forth, but they're not reporting on what actually took place. Our people never stop engaging that practice of offensive and defensive medicine, undu, kudu, and it will simply expand at the same rate that our people expand their consciousness of reconnecting, engaging in reversion. So, reversionalization. This is true with regard to chemical and biological warfare. It is also true with regard to waging war with metal armament. The more of our people get involved in ancestral culture, the less capacity the whites and offspring have to control the minds and therefore the movement of our people. They have no capacity to pinpoint when one person decides it's time to wipe out these crackers in a specific area. You can't stop Nyamewa Nyame from communicating with one of our people. And when they are ready to go to the ancestral realm and they have no fear of death because they communicate with their Nananom in Samampo every single day and they are looking forward to going to Asamando, the ancestral realm, and the Nsamampo direct them on that day to wipe out the enemy, you cannot stop that kind of intention, that kind of movement. So the best the white and the offspring can do is make us reject any notion of ancestral religion so we don't get to that point. But of course, it is too late because our people are expanding their consciousness of ancestral religious reversion every moment of every day. Self Reversionalization is happening every single day, and it is expanding. And there is no way to track the expansion unless you're connected with the Abosom and connected with the Nananom and Sumampo, which none of the white neural screen have the capacity they never have and never will until they become extinct, until we make them extinct. So we're going to take some phone calls on the phone line. If you have a question or a comment, you can hit the number one on the phone phone line so we can see that your hand is raised. If you have any questions and comments in the chat room, you have to log in as a user in order to interact in the chat room. Now, one of the comments in the chat room, the person posting says, I remember growing up as a child in Mississippi hearing stories of some relatives pouring poison in the wells of certain cracker families. Have you ever heard of any of those narratives anywhere in North America? So, absolutely. And of course, one of the, the most um, well-known is, as we mentioned, Okumpo Kwabena, Denmark, D.C. That was the reconnaissance plan, in, in a sense. It was the contingency plan. It was the scorched earth policy that they will poison the water supply, poison the wells, and kill everybody in the city. They didn't get a chance to get to that point. But it's all right, because the fact that they had to put
plan. The fact that they had over 9,000 people ready and moving in that direction struck such fear in the hearts of the whites and their offspring that now they were looking over their shoulder every moment of every day. And then there were other rebellions that jumped off, other wars that jumped off, and they were surrounded all over the South and different parts of the South, East, and North, insurrections breaking out every month, every year. And they saw the so-called slave system collapsing. Every time we waged war, every time we killed even one of them or 10 of them or 100 of them, or we poisoned one of them or 10 of them or 100 of them, they saw that this is something they could not control. They were forced into abolition. They were forced into accepting emancipation. They were forced into the civil war prompted by the Gullah Wars and so forth. They were forced into accepting repatriation and trying to move in that direction, even though some of our people had already been working, like Paul Kofi, had been working about on repatriation since the 1700s. A free Afurakani man in the Northeast trying to assist our people to get to places like Sierra Leone, but then the White Snarl Springs were forced into the position to, to begin to support that kind of repatriation movement because they saw our people waging war and killing the white and our spring. And they saw that any moment of any day or night, one of our people could poison everybody on the plantation. And they saw everything collapse. So even, if, even though they weren't able to get that plan totally off, the effect of their organization forced the white and our spring to make different decisions. Okay, we have a call on the phone line. You chair on the phone line, number 9384. You had a question or a comment? Yes, I have a question, Brother Kwesi. Uh First of all, Hatem. Um, so my question is this. Um, in regards to, I guess, receiving instruction via communication, I talked to a couple brothers and a couple sisters who have informed me that um and of course they study your curriculum, um, but they have, you know, reported to me that they're not um experiencing their own uh ancestors and ancestresses um communicate anything to them. Now my my, my question is uh well first of all, is there like a step by step procedure that they should take to contact their own uh, ancestors and ancestresses of their direct blood circle? You said other than, what was the second part you said? Is there is there any, like, um, specific steps? Is there, like, a, a set procedure that one should take to get in contact with their uh, ancestors and ancestresses of their direct blood circle? Yes, so what what happens very often, and there are a couple of things that happen. First, Mm -hmm. number one is consistency. So very often, sometimes people, we've had, um, and and this is just across the board, whether it's people um, learning about uh, the Akan tradition, or if they went to uh, Yoruba, Ile, or if they went to uh, people dealing with Vodun, or whatever they were engaged in, first learning anything about ancestral religious practice, and they learn about ancestral shrine communication, they get some basic thing, and then they begin to engage that process. Even for some people who say they learned about just rudimentary meditation, susu hum, or meditation, as it's called nakan, and they'll say, well, I, I tried to meditate, it felt like I was just sitting there, and I tried it a couple of times and it didn't work, so what's wrong? And it's about consistency. Because it's no different than going to work out at the gym. If you worked out one day and then you worked out two days later, you say, well, I've worked out two days and I'm not muscular muscular yet. Maybe I'm doing something wrong. But, of course, if you are consistent and, of course, the, you know, exercise and the, what, what's being done is proper, then you will grow and develop based on that consistency. The more consistent our people are with regard to communicating 
with their insamafo, the more their receptors become attuned. So it's not just going one time or two times. It's no different than working out. This is a spiritual, quote-unquote, workout, so to speak. So the consistency is key. Consistency as well as, you know, pure intent, but consistency is key. And you begin to become more receptive, and you break down those conditionings that this society is placed on our own perception. You reject all that nonsense, and you become more focused and more consistent, and you can attune to and hear and feel and get those communications. That's, that's right. number one, and that's what throws many people off. But the second thing that's probably even more and very often more um, directly um, impacting what they believe are is a lack of experience is the lack of being able to contextualize initially their experience because they haven't right. even realized that their insomnia have been communicating with them all along, they've been having sure. certain experiences, right. but they didn't realize that this was communication from their own mouth. So as we've talked about on a number of different broadcasts, the notion of achinebois or animal totem being sent by the insomnia, sent by the abotom at critical junctures in people's lives, they assume that these crows were showing up right next to their car and in front of their house and calling at them because, you know, birds just show up every now and then. But then when they learn about Achinebwa, learn about animal totems, and then they review what's been happening over the course of the past few months or years, they recognize that every time these crows show up, it's a specific um, issue going on in their life, and it's an admonition, a warning, guidance, and so forth. And then they begin to realize, wait a minute, I've been communicated with all along. And the things that I was trying to get done, I was moved into a position to come in contact with the right people at the right time to get this um, issue resolved. And then they begin to properly contextualize the experiences they have actually been having ever since they were children. And then they realize, wait a minute, I have been communicating with them some awful. Now I just simply need, need to be more receptive and properly contextualize these experiences and be more consistent where I can even get more detailed information right away. So those are the right. two things, consistency, but then at the same time, proper contextualization. And when people focus on those two things, they will realize those communications have been happening. Now, some people are a little right. bit more receptive than others, so instantaneously they are right. more clairvoyant, and their clear audience, they exactly. see spirits walking around, and they can hear them, or they can feel them, and so forth. Some people are, are like that, and some people, they've yeah. been like that since they were children. Some people have those capacities as children or young adults, and then they suppress them because of this society and other different things, and now they're just trying to re, um, reestablish those capacities and, and stop suppressing them. So it just depends right. on the person and what they've been through, but it's that consistency as well as proper contextualization, and that transforms their experience from that point on. Okay. Um, thank you. Now, okay, so... Would it be safe to say um, that someone who is consistent, um, and, and like I said, like, uh, you know, what I'm asking you, I, these questions actually come from other people, but I don't have enough experience or enough wisdom to be able to, you know, uh, answer it, you know, accurately. So what, I'm, oh, so what I want to ask is that um, because I can't, what, what I'm saying is I can't help them because, Everything was natural to me. Like you, you know, you were just speaking about those people. Everything was natural. They didn't have. It was, they were just born. Their, it's their spirit. So, um, but for others, you know, who I guess uh, don't have natural ESP or whatever you want to call it, um, if they aren't receiving anything, because how I how I think about it, I don't like. I really believe that our ancestors and our ancestresses have the power to, like, communicate with us regardless of our psychic ability. Um, right. If they need to get through to you, they're going to get through to you, and they're going to use whatever is around you to get through to you. So right. um, is, it, is, it, is it safe to say, uh, for instance, like, say you – because I, I notice a lot of people do that with your curriculum. Um, our people are easily seduced. And I think that, you know – 
are when we observe any African spirituality and its authenticity, uh, it kind of triggers that soul memory, you know, and it makes us gravitate toward that tradition even if, if it's not ours. You know what I mean? Right. And a lot of people, um, what I'm realizing is that a lot of people get a hold of this curriculum. For some, they are a con, and their whole life has led up to this moment, you know. And then for others, this curriculum basically bridges the gap between themselves and the tradition that comes from their direct blood circle. So is it right. safe to say if it's okay, say if someone gets a hold of this curriculum, okay, Um and I promote it because it's the tools that I use to get in contact, you know, with my non non you know, and through them I learn my tradition. Now, is it safe to say that if someone does get a hold of this curriculum, and you know how people, you know, I know you've seen it plenty of times, you know, uh, they take up an Akan name, they start going by the Akan seven-day week and all this other stuff, and they're not even Akan. Um, and then they're wondering, like, you know, well, what's going on? I'm not hearing nothing. I'm not seeing nothing. Would it be safe to say that they are not a con if the a con, not an um, samanfo, is not communicating with them? Or does, you know, they still have, do they still have the power to communicate with uh, the a con ancestors and ancestors? Well, now, there's, there's a couple of things. Number one, that on one hand, that goes to contextualization. Um, because, like, like you said, people, it's, it's not always about like people are not always clairvoyant. Some people have those capacities. Everybody has those capacities at some degree. Right, right. Some are just more, right. uh, you know, it's just right. more. Um, and, and some others it hasn't been as developed yet. But everybody has that capacity. But one of the major right. ways they communicate with is through dreams. When I mean, people are, are exactly. either not as clairvoyant or clear audience and so forth. Or if they've simply been suppressing that because they've been conditioned to suppress it, one of the easiest ways for them to to connect with them is through dreams. So when they fall asleep, they're not suppressing at that point, and those smallfoot can communicate directly with them. And once they are able to properly contextualize that, like, wait a minute, they've actually been communicating all along through my dream, um, and sometimes they may not even remember their dreams until the specific issue shows up at a specific juncture, and then that triggers the memory of that ancestral communication through the dream, and then they realize, hey, this has been happening all along. Now, so that's part of the contextualization piece. The second part is um, these are, when we talk about the unsumapo, the ancestors and ancestors, these are people who have to always remember. These are your direct blood relatives, your grandmothers, grandfathers, great-grandmothers, great-grandfathers, great-great going back. These are your relatives. And so they will communicate with you just like when they were here. Um, They will communicate with you and seek to give you guidance and so forth. When they make their transition, there are certain ones within the clan that are assigned to assist you in your development, those who are spiritually cultivated. So Uh, these are our people. Now, when we talk about ancestral communication, one of the things that we always point out is that if people do not know exactly who they are, Mm-hmm. then the language and culture of ancient Kanat and Kemet is the parent. We're talking about 40,000 plus years ago, not just early pre-dynastic Kemet. We're talking about tens of thousands of years ago. That is the parent culture and language from which our people migrated from. So all of the various languages on the continent can be traced back to that. And that's been shown linguistically as well as culturally and ritually and so forth. So we always exactly. let people know if you don't know what, who exactly you come from, you have a Kemeti Feku, you have an ancestral clan, ancestresses and ancestors from ancient Kemet and Kanat, whose responsibility is actually to communicate with you, to show you what group you come from. So we always direct people, utilize the language of ancient Kemet and Kanat through your evocation of the ancestresses and ancestors, the Aku, the Akutu, the spiritually cultivated ones, and they will direct you not only to proper um, insight into ancient ancestral religious culture, but they will also direct you as to what clan you come from. And then once they do so, then you can begin to incorporate that. So we never direct people to say, hey, embrace the Akan tradition, and then at some point you will find out. We never direct people to do that. 
We even have a, a basic prayer on the on the website in the language of Kemet, where people can utilize that, or they can look in the various texts of Kemet, utilize those um, prayers and so forth in that ancient language to communicate with their direct ancestors and ancestors of Kemet and Kana. And that way people find out exactly who they are through their ancestors and ancestors and begin to embrace that, whether they are Igbo or Basa or whatever it is. So on one hand, it's properly contextualizing the experiences they have and begin, even just beginning to realize that the things that you've ignored all your life, like just saying, oh, I just had a dream, or, oh, you know, um, this animal just showed up, or, hey, this person just happened to show up in my life with the exact answer to the question that I've been having. When you start to recontextualize these things and show the link and recognize the link, then you can begin to recognize that the Insamal has been communicating all along, and then you're consistent with regard to ritual practice, and you begin to attune your receptors so you're more focused, more receptive, and you have more insight. So I would, I, that, that would be my answer to that. Okay, thank you. You know, um, everything you said was very helpful. It just it, it had concerned me because I actually, there was a, um, you know, a sister, you know, that I communicate with and interact with, and um, she is someone who studies the curriculum, and so, you know, she had started going by the, you know, the seven, uh, Akan seven-day week. And um, I, you know, it, it, it used to kind of make my spirit feel funny, like, with her doing that. And, um, but I never said anything about it. Like, I don't want to deter anybody from, you know, what, you know, what they do. But I actually had a dream where my Nanamu came to me directly and told me to tell her she is not a con. And it was just like, okay, um, I really don't, you know, like, I was like, okay, like, that's a big responsibility, you know. But I, I you know, I basically regurgitated, you know, everything that I heard you say. I was, you know, led her back to Kani, and I said, you know, utilize um, that system, that, that spiritual system to find your way back to your tribe. So, but, yeah, you answered everything, um, you know, uh, sufficiently so I can utilize that information to uh, give to those who have these type of questions. But thank you. Merase. Okay. Any I'll say that. We appreciate the call. And that's important because there, there's a couple of things with regard to that. Number one, um, our con culture, when people learn about the seven-day week in our con culture and they learn that there are names associated, male and female names associated with the Abosom, the deities that govern the seven-day week automatically, then it's very, you know, very attractive to a certain extent because people hear that and they say, well, I can find out what my name would be if I was Akan immediately and take on that name instantly without trying to figure out anything else. I know if I was born on a Miminida, a Saturday, if I'm a male, I know it's Kwame, and if female, I'm I'm in many while, I'm may while, the different variations of that. So it's attractive in a sense when people say, well, I can, I can have a name immediately and I can begin to embrace something instantaneously. I can make a change in my life overnight because they are, the Akan people have a system with regard to that. So sometimes people are naturally attracted to just being able to do that. But the key is, of course, you find out who you are. If you're not Akan, you're not Akan. But you're, if you're Yoruba, then they have their own means by which they, you know, determine what name should be. And once you engage that process and learn about your Yoruba ancestry, it will be just as rewarding as receiving a Yoruba um, name or designation directly from your Egungun in Orisha, just as it is for an Akan person, um, or whatever group you come from. So it's no rush. It's not like if you don't do it within a certain number of days, you have to go back to church or something. There's no, it's not like a deadline. And some of are not on a, you know, a deadline to get you, get you on, put you on. You listen to what their direction is, the information they're giving you and so forth, and every step of the way as the journey is unfolding, that's a rewarding journey every step of the way, so you don't want to, um, try to fast forward that or short circuit that. That's, that's one thing. On the other hand, some people are attract, attracted 
on what they, they believe that they are attracted to the Akan tradition simply because based on the way that we promote that and the way that we articulate the Akan tradition. And they recognize it's revolutionary and resolutionary. And they recognize it's uncompromised. So they're attracted to that and they say, well, I must be Akan because I'm feeling it. But in reality, every Apurakani, Apurakani tradition can be articulated exactly in the same way we articulate the Akan tradition because divine love, love, and divine hate are the two poles of divine order, period, across the board. And every ancestral religious tradition has um, terminology that expresses that in reality. The problem is Negroes within not only the Akan tradition and other traditions have been at the forefront misrepresenting these various expressions of culture. So they haven't been teaching you divine law, love, and divine hate in the Yoruba tradition, or in Vodun, or Igbo, or even some of the pseudo-expressions of ancient Kemet and so forth, they haven't been telling the truth about that. Because if they were, they would be articulating these same principles in the same fashion just as we do with regard to the Akan tradition. So when people feel the militancy within the Akan tradition, that exists in all of the traditions. So that the reason it resonates with you is because you understand the contractive pole of divine order is divine hate, and you know that's one half of the created order in reality, in the universe. So you're drawn to that because you're not used to hearing that, but you know it's real because it's buried within you. It's part of your nature. So we're just articulating something that's an expression of who you are and who every Afurakani and Afurakani person is in the nature of reality, and you will find that in your tradition. So it's not like you have to try to embrace the Akan tradition, even though that's not who you truly, truly are, just so you can get to a militant or a grounded, real perspective of ancestral religion, all of the ancestral religious expressions are fundamentally the same. And if there are Negroes in tradition misrepresenting it, that means you need to embrace your tradition and you articulate it properly and crush these Negroes and expose the fact that they don't know what the hell they're talking about. So, and that's part of ancestral religious reversion. So, um, so we've got a few more calls on the phone line. And we may not be able to get to everybody, but we want to get to a few of them. Okay, Michelle, we're on the phone line, number 7871. You had a question or a comment? Makir, my brother. Nigel, what's Can you hear me? Can you hear yes. me? Yes, brother. Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, now. I'm at a comment and a question this evening. Thanks for a, a great show again. Uh, first, on the, uh, on the medicine issue, uh, uh, also to bring out the fact about our longevity and survival here if we don't immediately start to step up to the plate and get remedies for our people. Of course, we're naturally uh, uh, suffering in many ways health-wise, and we need our, our experts, as it were, you know, on the ground here. I just want to just add that to the uh, to the program. Uh, secondly, uh, also about survival and also longevity. I remember the ancestors of old lived a lot longer than we are today. That's why wisdom was, uh, you know, better understood. Why they were able to to uh, to know what to do and how to do it because they they lived longer. I mean, it's just you know that's the way it is. And then also with uh, with these medicine. Uh, it's also useful in, in technology uh, as far as our survival and our, and our, and our uh, rebuilding ourselves. It's, it's using uh, herbs and other minerals it's for solar cells, which, again, the, the crackers, are, again, all they're doing is working on organic elements. Not any, they've gotten away from, the, from just the metals now. They're into organic solar cells, uh, organic lasers. And these things we can again go into ourself, of course, going into our ancient our ancient selves. We can, um, you know, catch up to that and supersede them, which is very important. It isn't, you know, we never lost. We're just behind right now. If we pull these, get to this this science of the uh, both some will tell us what to do, as you've been stating. It is true. I mean, I've, I've bear witness. I've lived it. I'm just finding out the whole history, and you know, I'm really really. Uh, Proud of, happy about that. And then now the comp, the uh, the question is on Pata. 
the brother um, Stance, can you give input on Pata and Kunum? I, I was understanding that Kunum was the fashioner and Pata was the creator. Is that uh, misinformation or is that, uh, or are they simultaneous? Can you answer that? And also on that same note, uh, relating to uh, yeah, as a war, it's warfare, the, the staff of Pata, it looks, uh, if, if you can picture it, He's, he stands he stands forward with the uh, symbol. Of, it looks like Seth, the the pillar of Osir, of, Sar, of Osar, and then on the bottom of it, it's like a object. Looks like it's doing work in the earth or something. If you have any information, could you share that with me, please, or share it with us, please? Okay, and, and may I say for the common and the question as well. And yes, that like you were saying with regard to them moving from more, you know. Uh, uses of plastic type, you know, technology to organic materials, really going back in a sense to our cosmology and recognizing that we had within, and we have within the earth elements and so forth, all the materials we need to develop the technology that's most um, useful today. E even with regard to uh, quantum mechanics and, and physics and so forth, when they talk about the unfolding of the universe and you see various different things, the so-called theories that they have now simply mm -hmm. reflect the cosmology of our people. So we don't have like cosmology and mythologies that were silly and, and in the past, and now there are some new, you know, uh, models for the unfolding of the universe. When you look at our cosmology, lays out step by step the unfolding of the universe and the quantum mechanics and so forth, simply repeat that narrative with new language or, you know, Absolutely. manipulative language. And, it's, and that's similar to what you were saying about them moving towards organic materials for the um, photoreceptors and cells and so forth, as opposed to the plastics and other things that they were using. Um, they're just moving back towards what our people had already begun. And, of course, it, it proves, as you said, with regard to Hudu and Juju and Vodun and Wanga and Gangan and Frigri and so forth, we have these organic materials that we have been able to attune to the spirits that undergird them and fashion what we need to fashion to heal ourselves, protect ourselves, as well as build. And so that gets into the notion of Pata and Kulwimu. So Pata is the fashioner of um, the universe, fashioner of planets, sun, moon, stars, black substance space. He's the fashioner dealing with thermodynamics, the expansion and contraction of matter and so forth, and, and fusing those things and fastening them and making them into entities. Um, but when you have Kunrimu or Kunum, the platform ram headed divinity, he is yep. the conjoiner. So he's the one when the top fashions an entity, Kunrimu conjoins um, opposites. So he's, for example, the sperm cell in fact, fact, the term kunimu or kunim means to conjoin. So the sperm cell and the ovum, they have to unite and they have to fuse. And kunum, whose force, his energy fuses those things together. Once they're fused together, then the schematic that's written into their nature, the blueprint, so to speak, it has to unfold and put top fashion that matter into the specific form according to its spiritual blueprint so that they can realize their function and creation. So Kunwimu is the conjoiner, and of course, Heheru is the magnetism that draws those elements together. Kunwimu fuses them together, the path fashions them according to their proper nature, and so they work together in that regard. So you see Pata and Kunwimu working, working together. Sometimes they even have Pata on a potter's wheel as well as Kunwimu. And he also fashions or oh, conjoins the Ka, the Ka as the soul of the person with the physical body and fuses them together. So, now, does that, does that make sense? Yes, it does, yes. Yeah, that's uh, okay. what uh, a group called the African Creation Energy. Uh, some brothers, sisters are uh, pretty keen on, on uh, African technology. And I've, and I've seen, you know, the, the pictograms and stuff in the past, uh, always closely related between those, those two deities. So, yeah, that does. And just another note on the quantum mechanics issue. Remember that the father of so-called, the cracker so-called father of uh, quantum mechanics, Max Planck, 
copied uh, the pyramid code, uh, the, the Planck numbers, the Planck constants, uh, the, the so-called father of quantum mechanics copied all, all those measurements out of the pyramids. So there goes, uh, you know, again, another one of their uh, lies. But yes, brother, I definitely appreciate that information this evening. And I uh, hope to, hope to uh, hear from you, hope to uh, listen in again uh, very soon. Okay, Medhase, we appreciate those comments. Medhase. And and the other piece, the um, caller mentioned, um, apparently he was talking about the WASP uh, scepter, sometimes held by Ptah, as well as some of the other divinities, and that WASP scepter is dealing with expansion. So sometimes you see the divinities holding a scepter, um, that wasp scepter has the head that looks similar to the set animal. Then it's like a, a hook on the bottom, and that wasp is dealing with um, expansion. But when, just like when we have uh, in the book Kemetena and Toro, and we're talking about the axe and that being a symbol of divinity, it's not just a symbol. It has utility. So these various scepters have utility. When someone gets possessed and they grab that axe, the deity possesses somebody and is operating through the body of the person, they grab the axe. They utilize that instrument to wield their energy. And it's the same thing with the wasp scepter grabbed by Ptah. Ptah is the fashioner of creation, but he's dealing with thermodynamics. Thermodynamics that the expansion and contraction of the heating and cooling that goes into the shaping of the earth at the earth's inner core where Pata dwells, and he's at the inner core of planets and suns and moons and stars and so forth, and the inner core of our bodies as well, going through the, the uh, brain, forming our thoughts, intentions, and actions, and so forth. But that wasp scepter dealing with expansion, we're talking about the expansion and contraction of that fiery energy that's given by Ra and Raya. They give the divine living energy, that explosive power that explodes within the blackness and carves out black spheres in the blackness for the first time, the energy of Ra and Raya, but that divine living energy is fashioned into specific forms, and those specific forms carry uh, potency. So a sphere has its own form, and it carries a certain potency of energy. Uh, a triangle or a prism, a triangular prism, is a certain form, and it carries a certain potency of energy. A rectangle, uh, any specific form has its own, it's a, it's a matrix or it's a matrix or plural matrices of energy. So when Patah fashions specific form, they carry the potency based on that diagram. So he's expanding and contracting, but he's fashioning forms that Watt scepter has to do with expansion, the expansion, the heat aspect of the form. He wields that scepter to expand that energy that's been given by Ra and Raya into a specific form that carries a specific potency of energy that can be used. It's very similar to when, when you have a battery. The elements that go into the battery, whether it's a 9-volt battery, a AAA battery, or, you know, a C battery, a D battery, or whatever, they are fashioned to a specific form, they have a specific shape, and they carry a potency of energy. And based on their form and their size and so forth, they can be at some point used and you can release that energy through that form. So the energy is contained within that form and specific potency ready to be used at a certain time. The top fashions the physical bodies um, of, you know, planets, sun, moon, stars, and so forth. They have specific potencies. Once they are invoked in the spirits that animate them are invoked, their particular Frequency of energy can be accessed, can be provoked. And he fashions that and forms that within each naturally created entity. And that wasp scepter dealing with expansion has to do with that. And he wields that expansive energy by holding that scepter, including when he possesses. Okay. Okay, so we're getting into, it's getting a little bit late in. So we'll take another call on the phone line. Um, on the phone line number 2306, Michelle, you had a question or a comment? Chamo, this is Jelani. Um, just 
Yes. Uh, just a few days ago, um, I guess um, I would say that if I experience an example of a clear audience, um, because basically I heard what sounded like someone calling me by my childhood nickname, but of course when I got up, I when I physically got up to look around to see who it was uh, in the house, there was you know I didn't see physically see anyone there. So I've had occasions where um, it'll be just like you know someone call sounds like someone's calling my name, and it'll be it'll be so distinct that be at least to me no almost no different from if someone was physically calling my name. So I so I'm taking it and that would mean that some of my relatives or ancestors are communicating directly to me in that way. So I guess in what way would I be able to I guess improve my ability to I guess hear <laughs> You know, hear them as far as. Yeah, and, and in fact, that's, and we appreciate that um, you sharing that information because, you know, people, even people who don't necessarily, they may not call in, but they have similar experiences, and that allows them, that helps them to contextualize their own experiences. So, yes, that does happen, and that is frequent, whether sometimes as children that happens or as, as adults. Sometimes that happens and people, you know, get a little bit nervous because they think, you know, they're crazy or something is going on and so forth um, mentally. But in reality, that is a common occurrence. So it's nothing to be alarmed about. Yes, ancestors and ancestors or sometimes non-relatives who, you know, were familiar, um, who may be still connected in some way, they do communicate in that fashion. Um, so, and, and so you asked about what is a way to refine that? And it always goes back, whenever you're talking about any form of refining your spiritual capacity, it has to do with, um, of course, physically, purification, um, GDA purification, making sure you're not, you know, polluting your body and things like that, making sure your body is a clean vessel to resonate that kind of energy, mentally making sure you're not getting out of harmony with order. When we get out of harmony with order, when we engage in thoughts and intentions and actions that are governed by lust and or malice, instead of operating in harmony with the law, then we begin to suppress our capacity to hear and attune to those spiritually cultivated ancestors and ancestors as well as our own ka, kaya. So purification on the outside, physical body, as well as um, inside, spiritually, but consistency. Um, as we talked about with the previous caller, one of the previous callers, being consistent with that pure intent but being consistent with ritual work to charge up your spiritual receptors, even taking just a few minutes every single day. No different than working out. If you take the time to engage in susu home, so-called meditation at the shrine for the ka, the ka, or the shrine for the sinsamako, the ancestors and ancestors, the more you engage that process, with a purified foundation, the more receptive you become. It's no different than physically working out. The more you work out properly on a consistent basis, the more toned the muscles become, meaning they become um, instruments to resonate energy. They become strong and toned and so forth. It's the same thing with your quote-unquote spiritual or psychic muscles. The more you engage ritual practice, the more attuned you become and the more sharp um, those visions become, the more vivid the dreams become. If you're more inclined towards clear audience, some people are more inclined towards clear audience naturally. Some people are more inclined towards clear audience where they can see. Some people are more drawn um, with regard to clear sentience where they may not see or hear an ancestral spirit, but they can feel, you know, heat moving through the body or coolness and so forth, those different feelings. They know a spirit is present in the room. Some people are more clear alien, meaning they smell show up and they can smell the scent of an ancestral spirit, the way that their, their previous body odor, that, that same scent coming off of their spirit, they know who's who just by detecting those scents and so forth, a powerful way to communicate. Some people are more clear goose scent where they have 
taste. The taste buds are stimulated. They begin to have certain tastes, bitter or sweet or whatever it is, depending on what kind of spirit is coming forward. Some people are more clear equilibrant, as we would call it, where they um, – they simply begin to lose balance, become, quote, unquote, kind of dizzy when an ancestral spirit moves through, and they can tell just by the movement, the, you know, their equilibration, determining what kind of spirit has come forward. Some people are more clear. to me if they lose track of time, the spirits come forward, and so forth. So it depends on the person. But whatever inclination, what direction you're moving towards naturally, it's always about consistency purification on the outside and inside and being consistent that tunes those receptors and refines those capacities. Right. So would it be something as simple as by going to meditation, just to say something, I guess, along the lines of, okay, well, I'm listening to, and then just wait for whatever comes, basically. Right. And, and you always, just always recall what, for example, when dealing with the ancestors as an ancestor, these are your direct blood relatives. So it's no different than if your grandparents were sitting in the living room, great grandparents, and you went before them, you pour libation, meaning you you know greeted them, and then you sat down to listen to hear what they had to say. It's exactly that's exactly what we're doing. We're pouring libation, giving offering, and so forth. It's like you're giving somebody a drink of water when they come to your house then you sit down and listen to what they have to say. If you feel drawn, they're pulling you to the shrine to communicate certain things, then you sit down and you're listening to what they have to say. But if you have questions or ideas or a desire to know a specific thing, you can project that as well. You don't even have to say it, you know, verbally per se. You can project what you're trying to know, what you're seeking to know mentally through, you know, imagery of what you're trying to find out, what you're trying to learn about and so forth. And yet, listening as well as, you know, putting forward what you're trying to gain, that, that kind of dialogue, and engaging that process on a consistent basis, that's what tunes those receptors. Right. Um, so, yes, yeah, so, so I take it, so on the occasions where I heard my name and it, you know, and it seemed as if, I guess the love, like the sound that there was someone physically there. Was that a matter of, I guess, the level of my sensitivity or was that just the strength of their communicating with me that it would register as if, you know, I'm hearing someone physically in the room? Now, it could be a little bit of both, depending on what's going on. If, if it was a you know, distressed kind of call. They may have been more forceful with regard to their, you know, trying to reach out. If it wasn't like that, it could could be more so leaning, tilting towards the degree of your receptivity. And sometimes people are simply, you know, born with that kind of receptivity. They already had it. Um, sometimes it develops later on. Sometimes once we get beyond certain conditionings that the society has conditioned us with ever since we were children, we start knocking some of that away just by studying true history and stuff like that. And like, you know what, I'm going to reject the nonsense that crackers have been brainwashing us with, and I'm just going to be open to what our people are talking about. Then that knocks away some of those suppressed, you know, conditionings, and then you're open and you, you're more receptive. You can begin to hear. So um, depending on the nature and the provenance of the communication, was it coming from a spiritually cultivated ancestor or ancestress, just a regular ancestor or ancestress, someone who is not cultivated, somebody who is not related, those kinds of things. So th those are the kind of things you're trying to find out. So when something like that happens, that first question is just, just like always, you know, look at it as though the people are physically present. If somebody called you, if you were in the house and somebody physically was in another room and they yelled out your name, you're going to get up and go over there and say, hey, why did you call me? What's the nature of this, you know, call? And it's the same thing spiritually. If an ancestor or ancestress calls you for one reason or another, you're going to go and say, okay, I'm going to go and sit down and find out who is it that's calling and what is the nature of the call? What are you trying to convey to me? And then if you receive some information, if you receive some ideas that you feel like have been planted in your spirit, as a result of 
putting those questions forward. Then you can ask the follow-up questions. Is this idea that I have right now, is this what you're trying to communicate with me? Is this correct? If it is, you can ask them to show you confirmation of that, and they will show you confirmation of that throughout the course of everyday life. They may put somebody physically in front of you at a store or at work or walking down the street or on the bus that actually confirms the question that you had and proves that what you believed it meant and you felt like they were trying to communicate is really it. So they can confirm things in various different ways. Right, right. <laughs> okay. Yeah, because uh, yeah, because um, on some of those occasions, it's like yeah, it's like I'll hear something and yeah, it'll be almost no different from if someone's physically calling me to the point where I would physically get up and start looking around and then see, well, there's no one physically there. So I'm like, oh, okay. Right. Exactly. <laughs> that one. One else. Right. Definitely. Right. So yeah, you want to find <laughs> out. Just, just like now, you, you're trying to find out the nature of the communication and who, who's who, why they're calling and, and do they have a specific message? If it, is, it, is it coming from a cultivated ancestral spirit or, or whatever? You're trying to find that out, so that's those are the kind of questions you um, you put to them, and then you can always right. ask for confirmation. It's not against quote unquote the law to ask for confirmation. In fact, they want to confirm so they know that you know that you're grounded and you know for sure what's happening. So they'll give it to you spiritually, but then they'll also follow up with some kind of physical confirmation so you're sure and you're grounded in knowing that this this is the answer. And they do that consistently over time. So you get to the point where every time you get something spiritual, at some point you can point to a physical confirmation of what they gave you spiritually. And then you're secure in those answers and those communications as they develop. Okay. So, yeah, so we appreciate, we appreciate the call. Mm hmm. May I say? I say. Okay. Okay, and we have, uh, you can say one more call. Um, Jim, we're on the phone line, number 3497. You had a question or a comment? Um, hello. Yes, I have a question. Um, it was in regards to, uh, I, was, I would guess I would say more so the overall, um, I would say um, fight we have, you know, against the European um, like with the state that black people are in now, you know, um, like for instance, in over in Africa, you have the um Asians coming over there, you know, oppressing our people. You have, you know, Indians and stuff like that. And my goal, my um, question is, um, if we was like to over, like I guess, win this racism war, like tomorrow, you know, um, how do we? cope with or deal with the um, stuff that's coming at our people from other ethnic groups as well? You know, um, do we look at them as European or do we take another approach to that? Okay, and that's, that's a good question. So you often hear us say, or the, we'll use the term achiwadiefo, achiwadie, and akan, adie means saying out of the theater, and see, chi means to hate or to abhor, to loathe. Achiwadie are things that are hateful, you know, taboos, restrictions, divinely prohibited. Achiwadie fo are the group of people who are divinely restricted or prohibited, divinely hated, rejected, taboo, and so forth. So that's the term we use in the Akan tradition, but um, in English you often hear us say the whites and their offspring. So we're not just talking about mm -hmm. white Europeans, we're talking about white Americans, white Hindus, white Asians, white Arabs, white pseudo-Native Americans, white Latinos, white Latinas, Hispanics, and so forth, all of them are the whites in their offspring. All of them are achiwadiefo, spirits of disorder, divinely rejected, divinely hated, spirits that do not have a kra, a krawa. They're all on the same lower level. So we deal with them in the same fashion. They're all part of the same disordered group. So whether it's the European in Europe and America and white Latinos and Latinos and Hispanics and so forth or on the continent, 
for people are dealing with some of them foolishly allowing these Asians to purchase land and take over resources and these Hindus and everybody else, as our people engage in reversion and get back to normal, then they repel these spirits of disorder and they seek to work with their own people, build from, you know, our own people, our own resources, and defend what we build. So we treat them all on the same level because they're all spirits of disorder, just different expressions of spirits of disorder. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense because I was just thinking about, like, you know, if, like, um, just with the dealing with just the white people in, in general, you know, um, like we could be so focused on that that you know you get rid of the threat with the European, and then the next thing you know we being enslaved by Chinese people, you know, because they view us the same. So, right, and it's similar to um, if you just think about it in terms of the physical body, you have. Mm-hmm. Uh, cancer cells developing from within, but then you also have toxins and and bacterium coming in from the outside. Your immune system recognizes and lymphatic system recognizes the internal threat and the external threat as a threat and neutralizes and eradicates them accordingly. So we recognize whoever is out of harmony with order, spirits of disorder, even those within our own community who have fallen into that type of criminal type behavior there, the enemy as well. So you got rapists and murderers and everything else following the culture of the whites in their offspring. They are the enemy as well. So that's the internal threat. And then you have, you know, various expressions of the achiwadiye folk, the spirits of disorder, the whites in their offspring, who are the external threat. And we deal with both accordingly. Okay. All right. Um, that answers my question. And um, thank you very much. And I enjoyed the show. Okay, Mirate, we appreciate you calling in. All right. Okay. And we have uh, one last call on the phone line. And before we take that call, uh, there was a question on, on in the chat room dealing with uh, generational Curses, can an energy be carried by members of family generation after generation or even a talent like seeing? Of course, those definitely um, the talents like seeing and so forth. And what it is is it's not just like uh, DNA transmitted, but remember, Bebra, which is rebirth or reincarnation, are people who have these capacities previously. They are reborn. They come back and born through the blood circle. They had those capacities previously, and they are born into the world and they still have those capacities. So in that sense, it is intergenerational. It's transcarnation. You can also have criminals who are spiritually disordered. They made their transition. They didn't become cultivated when they made their transition, and they can be drawn back through a specific blood circle where people have not really been engaged in any kind of spiritual cultivation or not on a level where they needed to be. They can draw some of those disordered relatives back into their blood circle and they come out and they they are engaged in negative behavior from an early age. Um, You can have negative ancestral spirits, discarnate spirits who are causing people problems. And if those are not neutralized, then they will cause somebody a problem. When that person grows up and has children, they will cause that child a problem when they grow up appears to be, oh, is this passed on genetically? But it's the same discarnate relative with causing everybody in the family problems and people are saying, well, this is an intergenerational curse. You you can call it that in a sense, but you're dealing with wayward discarnate spirits that need to be neutralized and then that will remove all of that negative um, activity. So we did do a broadcast overcoming transcarnational suffering talking about intergenerational, transcarnational, through successive incarnation, transcarnational suffering. When we get into detail about that, we have a document uh, that we published. We did a broadcast detailing that. And before we take the last call, it's only five minutes left in the broadcast. Um, We probably won't have to go into overtime. If if we go a couple of minutes into overtime, uh, the number is 657-383-0635. 657 You have about four and a half minutes to call in. 
because at 11.30, it will cut off automatically. Only the people who are on the phone will be able to listen beyond 11.30. So you have about four minutes to call in now, 657-383-0635. We probably won't have to go into too much overtime. We have one more call. Um, but if, before we take the call, if you support the work that we are doing, please go to the NHOMA page, the publications page on our website. You can public, purchase one or more of our 19 books. They range between 8 and $11. Most of them are either 9 or $10. Um, all of our broadcasts and, and everything else is based on the information that we publish in our books and the upcoming books that are coming out. Uh, we do have discounts on the first five books, five books for $40. That's a 20% discount. And any order of 10 books or more is automatically 30% off. The entire 19 book set is $125 for all 19 books. That's a 30% off and so forth. But any one book or more, they range between $8 and $11. So that, that is how we support um, everything that we're doing, the free conferences, workshops, trainings, including training dealing with overcoming transcarnational suffering, free classes. And once again, as we said earlier, we've given up away giving away over 800 of our soft cover books for free to the community in different um, states where we have uh, presented. And we're going to keep that program going. We're also raising funds to establish our institution so we can expand our class offerings, training, employment opportunities, and continue with our entrepreneurship program that we already have. Anybody who would like to distribute our books, our 19 books, as an independent entrepreneur, you can begin that immediately tonight. You purchase the books wholesale, 35% off, and then you sell them retail in your area. You're working for yourself. You're not working for us. You're working on your own time as an independent entrepreneur, sharing this information and generating income at the same time. So we want to expand all of those programs, meeting the needs of our people economically as well as culturally and spiritually by establishing a physical space permanent physical space for our institution, our Kongwa Sui Adai. We're raising funds for that. And the way we do that, you can go to our fundraising page, but any order of fifth, or any uh, contribution of $15 or more, you have the option of receiving one or more of our books in return for your donation. So it's not just the donation. You can receive one or more books. So you get that immediate benefit. But then the long-term benefit is an institution for youth as well as adults, our Kongwa Sui Adai. So whether you made a contribution there or one or more of our books, that is what supports the work that we are doing. So yet I say we thank you for that. And we're going to take this last phone call. Michia, um, we're on the phone line, number 2047. You had a question or a comment? Yes, Michia, no brother question. Um, I actually have two things actually, um, about the ancestors and communicating with their ancestors. Well, what I want to ask about that, some years, a few years back, to be exact, it was back in 2006, um, my great-grandmother, she used to try to, like, literally take me from my mother when I was a little girl. When she died, as in, she died in 1985. In 2006, I had a dream. In the dream, she was in the same white dress that she was buried in. In the dream, she reached out for me. And the closer she got to me, the the more I felt like there was this weight on my chest. And in the dream, I told her, I'm not going. So when I woke up, I was in threat of a heart attack. You know, my, my family members. They called the paramedics, and I had to, and they gave me one of those pills to, to prevent it, the nitro pills. Another thing, um, because I want to try to hurry along in case there's some more calls, I um, started studying in 2014, but my whole entire life I had been having certain dreams off and on, and to, to, to throw out a few of them out there real quick, one of them, I dreamed about seven moons in the sky was up on this hill, um, and there was some fire writing in the sky that I couldn't identify. That was one of them. It was more to it, but I'm trying to hurry along here. Um, and then another one that stood out from the rest, that I, there was this 
large, like, giant bird, and, it, you know, there's this voice coming from the bird. It said, look in my eyes, and one side was fire, and one side was rain. That stuck with me. And the final one, which I later found out, was the bird um, with the, the face was Bob. You know, and I found that out at the end of 2014. And uh, But I had dreamt, dreamt of it in the beginning of the um, the year 2014. And how I found out what that bird was is on social media. And it was a little creepy. I was a little spooked out, you know, because I, have a, I come from a Christian background, but I could never quite relate, you know, like everyone who turned away from Christianity, there was all, we were always suspicious of it. But in that dream, um, I was in this dark place, and, it, I, you know, it was dark outside, the stars were out. I remember looking up in the sky at the stars, and I walked into this barn that was just there abandoned, and as soon as I walked in, something dark grabbed me. But this bird flew in, and as soon as that bird flew in, that dark thing just released me, and I followed up some stairs. When I followed up the stairs, the face, the human face and the bird looked me directly in my face as if it wanted me to remember it. Now, you know, some months later, I was on social media and saw that bird, and I was like, that's that bird I saw in my dream. You know, can you explain these, these two, I mean, these things to me, what I might have been experiencing? Well, actually, you just explained because that that is the way. Now, now, when you saw the bird on social media, what was it? What what did you? Where did you see? I mean, was it like uh like an someone image? Had um, no, someone had posted it and said that it's by and that it, you know it was an explanation about what the bird was about a spirit and everything. The only difference in my dream is that the bird was all white. It was the size of a baby owl, you know, those little owls. It was right. that size, it was all white, and it had this this glow all around it, you know, and it, it just gave me this look in my face. It was a human face, and in the dream, I was, like, creeped out, and it, it was a strange feeling, you know, and I just never forgot it. So when you were talking about that, I was like, you know what, that was something that made, made me remember it, you know, when they say it, commun- you know, some people get the communication through the dreams, but when I saw that, but I, I still don't know why I saw that in my dream. And, and you know, I'm, I don't know, you know? Well, now, on one hand, now, what's the, just a quick question, was the, the face of the bird a male or a female? A male. Okay. All right. So, now, now we did a, actually, um, we did a broadcast specifically on the ba the ba bird. In fact, we did two of them, um, detailing the nature of that entity. And um, in fact, when you look on the the archives, whether you look on the YouTube channel Ojidafo on YouTube, or if you look on this channel right here, LogTalkRadio.com/Ojidafo. You'll see two of the broadcasts, and I don't know. I mean, it's it's probably halfway through. We have 222 broadcasts, so maybe halfway through. It, I know it was last year when we did that one. Um, you'll find it there. We went into some detail, but um, so you can check those out. But and we went out through some text in ancient Command talking about the nature of the Ba and so forth, and detailing. So you'll get some detailed information to confirm what you were saying. Um, but yes, this is the way. One of the ways that the Samanfo, the ancestral spirits, as well as the Abosom, the divinity, communicate, and they're doing it with you through vivid dreams. Um, when you had, for example, now you're talking about the great grandmother trying to take you away, and then you know making the transition, yes, still I trying to grab you and so forth. I haven't reached for ancestors since that because it kind of it creeped me out and left me with a a, a bad and you know feeling of, of that, so I haven't reached out to try to communicate with ancestors since then, you know, so when I do libations, you know, I don't do it to my grandmother, I avoid her. Right, now that right there, instinctively, you're on track, because what, what happens is, very often people talk about, hey, you know, African religion is about ancestral worship and communication, and people 
honor their ancestors because they help people out. And that's just people using English terms and they're kind of misrepresenting the tradition. We don't just communicate with our ancestors. First of all, we have ancestors and ancestors, but we communicate with the spiritually cultivated class of ancestors and ancestors. Those who are criminal, idiots, clowns, perverts, we don't communicate with them at all. We repel them. We have nothing to do with them. They need to suffer in the spirit realm just like they made people suffer here. But we have nothing to do with them at all. We only deal with those who are spiritually cultivated and those who are, you know, nice people, you know, uh, mothers, fathers, grandmothers, grandfathers who are nice people, even if they weren't necessarily highly spiritually cultivated, but they weren't idiots and criminals and stuff like that. They come to us periodically, but the specific class of spiritually cultivated ones, those are the ones who give us guidance. So that inclination you had to not include her was key and natural and on right on point. So that's a part of the process. You deal with those in your blood circle who are assigned to you, who are spiritually cultivated, and those are the ancestors and ancestors who, who are the only ones who are capable of giving you the kind of guidance you really need. Um, so that's that's on point. On the on the other piece with regard to some of the dreams, like with the seven moons and the different characters you were seeing. Um, in the sky, as a matter of fact, we mentioned yesterday on the broadcast when Kung Fu Yao, Nat Turner, was about to engage his rebellion, his insurrection. He talked about seeing hieroglyphic characters in the sky and nature, and he knew it was time for him to move against these crackers. So when they show you those kind of images, um, you want to, you know, try to remember them or record them, write them down, and so forth. You know, they'll they'll bring them back forward as well. It's not you know. They'll show it to you one time and never show it to you again. Once you become curious enough to begin to ask them like you're doing now and you go back and engage ritual practice, they'll bring those things back forward to you to show you exactly what they're trying to communicate with. But just the fact that they show specific symbols, specific matrices of energy in a specific way, they're trying to stimulate you, which they have, and you respond it to coming back to them so you can get realigned. You have the desire to realign with what's true, what's functional, what's real, what's harmonious, and rejecting nonsense. And they utilize those symbols to draw you in. That Each symbol has a, its own matrix of energy, its own frequency, and it draws you and stimulates you, your spare body, in a certain way so you can begin to realign and say, I need to know what I'm supposed to be doing in the world, what my functioning creation is, what I need to avoid who I need to avoid, who I need to connect with, whether it's family or, you know, other people related or unrelated and so forth. So they utilize those different images to pull you in the right direction and help you avoid certain individuals and entities along the way. So record those different things and then engage, you know, with them consistently. And the more consistent you are, those those dreams continue to be sharp like that and they'll you know, you ask for the meanings of them or what they're trying to convey. And when you get an answer or you feel like you got an answer, you can also ask for confirmation to see, is this answer that I think that you are trying to convey to me, is this correct? And you'll get something spiritually, but as we said with the other caller, they will also show you something physically, put somebody in front of you physically to confirm, just like you were able to get on social media and they, they orchestrated the events to a to the degree that they moved you into position to see that Bob Bird so you can see a physical confirmation of what they showed you spiritually. So they'll do that on a consistent basis. That's that's when I knew that I needed to that I was on the right path. That I mean that's the that's what I got from it when I saw that saw that bird on social media. I said well I, when I saw Bob, I said, you know what? I'm on the right path and no one can tell me anything different now. Because, I mean, so, I don't know. It, it's funny because after the seven moons, I end up having seven children. <laughs> you oh, know, not not directly after the seven moons, but, you know, I ended up with seven. My last one is a girl, and the rest of them are six sons. And um, so, it, it's, you know, it's, it's a lot of things tied into it that I'm still trying to figure out. And um, I've always been told that I had certain gifts and things like that, and I was taking it as a burden, but I'm learning to not wear it as a burden, you know, and sometimes it's hard, 
but the you know, but the dreams that's you know, like I said, and I used to see images like literally just standing in my bedroom, you know, so it, it made me scared of the dark when I was a little girl. I used to run in my mother's room from seeing certain images, you know. And she knew I would see things, so she never chastised me about it or anything like that. So I grew up really fearful of the dark because of the images. And, uh, you know, so it, it, it was a lot for me to, but I'm, seeing, I'm, I'm noticing a lot of things now and realizing what some things were, but I've just never been able to fully interpret the dreams and what they were telling me, you know. Right, and so after after a while, like even with the seven moons and so forth, and realizing it's being associated with these seven spirits who are ready to come through and actually came through you. Um, but, yeah, it starts off as, as, you know, because of this culture being like a burden because we've been conditioned to believe that everything is evil and criminal. And then sometimes a, a negative spirit will show up, and then it, it appears to confirm what people have been saying, like, all oh, this is a negative thing and all that. But... Now you're realizing it's not a burden. It's, you know, you have these capacities that need to be developed, and you're on the right track. So you can get those confirmations. You can repel the negative spirits, any ones that will show up. You can seal up any, quote, unquote, holes in your spirit body or aura so you won't have these negative spirits trying to come through. And the more you consistently deal with your insomnia, you seal up those holes, you tell those negative ones, and you can, you know, continue on the track that you're already moving along. Okay. Okay. Well, that that's you were real helpful, Madase, Brother Quasi. Okay. You know, I'll say that. We appreciate the call. Okay. Okay. So that was the the last phone call. 1142. So, may I say, uh, we thank you for tuning in to the broadcast. And again, please go to the NHOMA page on our website, the publications page, support the work that we are doing. And we will meet again. That's up.